It's so strange for, for Jews to quiet down by themselves without being told. So, it, it, um, but okay. Um, everyone thinks they know him with good reason, and we understand that. But who is this Rabbi Rick Jacobs really? Well, actually, a native of New Rochelle. who left as soon as he could walk, and even before. <laughs> who grew up, of course, in Orange County, California, just to torment me, a lifelong Dodgers fan, Dodgers fan, and stole Mookie Betts for me. It's a whole other story. We're not going to go after that. After serving Brooklyn High Synagogue for nine years, came back home where he'd interned at Westchester Reform Temple in Scarsdale, carrying on the work of really the great Sadiq of our generation, or the generation before me, uh, Rabbi Jack Stern. And of course, in the process, he became a Sadiq as well. For our he was our neighbor for 20 years. Then duty called, or perhaps it was the Holy One, as he became president of the Union for Reform Judaism, today representing us, nearly 2 million North American Jews. So he's the guy who, serving so many, tries to make a place in our movement for everyone. And though his home is here, New York City, Westchester, Reform Judaism is everywhere. So he's also the guy who's been marching alongside leaders of the IMPJ, the Israel Movement for Progressive Judaism, to preserve democratic values in our state, but who now stands strong with citizens of Israel and the state of Israel in the call to defend and secure our home. He is likewise the guy who sat in recent days, punim to punim, face to face, with the president of the state of Israel, Isaac Herzog, pledging our commitment and heart. For even at the darkest moments, this rabbi helps us know we have the power to create light. And that's because no matter with whom he's punim to punim, face to face, generations of Westchester Reform, members or leaders of our movement, young and old, or members of congregations for, from Albany to Albuquerque, he's the guy, that very tallish rabbi, who makes you feel seen and heard and loved. 
Who's this guy they call Rabbi Rick Jacobs? Ever a modern dancer at heart. He's the mensch in a million who never stops moving or moving us. The leader who lifts us up as he inspires us to reach out. The rabbi of rabbis who cries when we are in pain and celebrates our simchas, who helps us stand proud as the progressive Jews we aspire to be. Indeed, he's the guy who magically makes us feel as tall as he. With a gratitude for the gift of his presence beyond words, my friend, our rabbi, Rick Jacobs. Rabbis are sometimes hyperbolic. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed that, but it's a, it's a trade a thing that we do. First of all, it is great to be here. People say, why are you here? Because Rabbi Serkman invited me. Why would I not be here? Um, it is an impossible moment. It's not working. See, don't talk to the senior rabbi. Talk to the people. I like the people who understand the tech. Test, test. It's on. Maybe it just needs closer. You know what? Use these mics, too. I don't know what's on. How many Jews does it take to give a talk? I love it. I love it. Okay. It is good to be with you. <laughs> and of course, we're at a particular moment, but I just want to back up from the drama of the moment that we're in and just set a context of kind of where we are, not just as a, an amazing congregation in Westchester, New York, but where are we in this reform movement? You might remember, a few of you, the summer of 1873. Anybody? <laughs> anybody go back? OK. it was. So in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the summer of 1873, 28 congregational leaders came together and they founded something called the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. That was 150 years ago. That's the extent of my mathematical ability. How old is Larchmont Temple, friends? So if you think about you're half the age of our beloved reform movement here in North America. And I want to just set a context to see not just where we've been, going back maybe the whole stretch all the way back to the beginning in 1873, or the beginning of this great congregation in 1948. There was something else that started in 1948. I always try to remember. What else, what else began in 1948 that we are, of course, so to imagine the people who came together to create this congregation right as Israel was being born, it's kind of a, a remarkable, not just coincidence, but synergy. So as Rabbi Serkman mentioned, I, I did serve this congregation down the road a bit, maybe down the road a bit that way. I should have lost my <laughs> bearings there. And tomorrow night, don't tell anybody, but tomorrow night, Westchester Reform Temple <clears throat> celebrating our 70th anniversary. They're kids. They're just, they're, they're just new to the whole effort of being a dynamic congregation. But there's no, there's no competition. I know that. In fact, I think I saw half of Westchester Reform Temple, now members of Larchmont Temple. We, we, can we talk about that? That's, it's, it's all good. It's all good, friends. So one of the things that's worth paying attention to is, to me, the thing that's constant in any dynamic, vibrant community in our movement, in our Jewish people, it's about leadership. And leadership that has both courage and vision and love and all of the gifts that we need. And of course, in the Bible, we know all the, the big people. We know Moses. We know, of course, Aaron, Miriam, Deborah, Joshua, B'Tselel. But here at Larchmont Temple, there are a lot of people who make this place what it is. But it, can I just single out your rabbi for a moment? This guy. <laughs> there are plenty of, of good rabbis around. This is a rabbi's rabbi's rabbi. I don't know a finer rabbi on planet Earth. 
I don't know one that loves people and Torah and God as much as this rabbi does. And of course, he's planted that in all of you and together in our movement. The only thing, I wish you could get him to not root for that team and <laughs> lost him. But I, I, I probably shouldn't push that too far because I don't think I'm changing you in that way. But if you've been with him, you know the gift he has. I, I'm with him every year. His senior, sermon, his senior seminar is all of the graduating rabbis and cantors. And Rabbi Serkman is like, you know, Leonard Bernstein. He is drawing out everyone, the best that's in them. And he leaves his heart stamp on each of them and on so many that are, are leading Jewish life. And of course, I'm thinking about, thank you, uh, the rabbis who come up and also make sure that you got the right microphone on. Leora, thank you, thank you. The cantors, I also can remember, um, Leonard Poller of, of blessed memory. And I also want to thank your, your um, executive director. Jane, put your hand up. I get this is her day job, this is her night job, this is her weekend job. <laughs> but during this last year, when we were needing to stand tall for Israel's democracy, uh, there were a few people in New York that made that happen. And Jane is one of those people. Really, really <laughs> remarkable. And uh, your president, of course, comes from a noble uh, family in our movement. Uh, many of our, our, our ordination certificates are signed by your father, Bert. And I also just think about the lay leadership of this congregation that's made it strong. And, and I was looking, there's some guy named Jeff Wang. I think he's a vice president. I was thinking, you know, I, I actually confirmed a guy named Jeff Wang. I think I officiated at his wedding. And, you know, is that the same Jeff Wang <laughs> who used to be at Westchester Reformed Temple? Is it the same one? Oh, look, look at that. Look at that. Yeah, there, there are not that many of them floating around. So I want to set a frame for um, the conversation tonight, which is going to be about all the shifts and changes that have happened and still need to happen. I think it's weird. No, 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 don't. Don't, don't you know what? No, no, don't, don't, don't mess, don't mess. Cast. Look at that, Look. it works. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, he's going to tell me there's something called the internet. Like... <laughs> okay, there we go. So that's working, right? You can hear. So the question of not just what's changed, but what still needs to change for us to stay strong. So my teacher, uh, Marty Linsky, used to teach at the Kennedy School. He would have this amazing story about change. So he makes it really uh, very, I think, real, because he talks about his mother, who the time of the story was in her mid-90s, living in Florida and driving. So he would go to visit her every year, and um, the car always had all these new scratches on the side. So he had a dilemma. The dilemma was, do I just take the car and get it touched up? Or do I have the hard conversation, right? You know what the hard conversation is with mom who's driving in the mid-90s in Florida and banging into everything, right? And most of the trips, he would just have the car touched up a bit and not have the hard conversation. But the hard conversation is the one that really adapts, right? Because the hard conversation is, it's dangerous for her to drive. So he's got to actually have that conversation because it's not only dangerous for her, but it's dangerous for everyone. And uh, for her, what's, what's the dilemma for her? Loss of freedom. She's the only one of her peer group that actually is taking people to the concert and to the this and the that. But he says in most of the key institutions of our world, we have technical and then we have adaptive changes. Technical ones are pretty simple, right? Someone says, you know, hey, the bulletin at Larchmont Temple, it's, um, it's just not a very interesting font. Well, like, so change it. But then the, the adaptive challenge is, why are we so connected to a print bulletin? In the 21st century, is that actually how we should be communicating? So again, what are the adaptive ones? Those are the profound, they shift everything about who we are and how we do our work. Technical ones, we do all the time. They don't require uh, that much energy. 
So for us, I think as a reform movement, we have lots and lots of adaptive challenges and we have some that we can look back on and say we have been pretty bold about it. So the thesis here is uh, we have been bold and we need to still be bold. So I want to just bring you a teaching from the, the rabbi who inspired me to want to go to rabbinical school. His name is Rabbi David Hartman. He, is the, he was the founder of the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, now, of course, very much in North America, wonderful Orthodox rabbi. And he has the following teaching, which I just think is for this moment. He says, the challenge facing Judaism today is not only whether we can withstand our enemies, but also whether the light visible in the marketplace radiates a profound and compelling message. Okay. We have enemies. Did, did that memo come across here in Larchmont? We got enemies. We have enemies. And we have to be serious about them. But if there isn't something so compelling about what we do and who we are, frankly, we'll be focused on the wrong things. So there are seven things I want to do tonight. Seven things. Count them with me. First thing. Are we going to talk about the war in Gaza? Of course we are. Are we going to talk about anti-Semitism surging through North America in pretty much every one of our communities, and especially on the college campus? Of course we are. We're also going to talk about the transformation of the way Jews experience Judaism and live lives of depth and meaning. That has to be talked about. We're going to talk about the synagogue is the most adaptive institution the Jewish people have ever created. We're going to talk about that as well. We're also going to talk about, are we the ever-dying people? Are we at a point where you just say, will the last person out turn out the lights? Are we fading from Jewish life? Are we disappearing? I just heard, by the way, 25 new members this year. Did you get the memo we're disappearing? Well, who knew? Who knew? You're not. But we're going to talk about that because that is the big narrative that is in, internalized in so many different settings. We're also going to talk about, is our work for a more just and equitable world, is that really a part of Judaism? If it is, what's the imperative today? And then the last thing we're going to talk about, what are the strategies that are going to help to grow our Jewish community and deepen our Jewish community at the same time? So we're going to do all those things, not in that order, but I want to do them with you. So can we just talk about the ever-dying people? That's a very famous essay written by uh, Simon Ruidowitz that turns out that the Pew survey, people read the Pew surveys. My feeling, by the way, if we read the Torah as carefully as we read the Pew surveys, we would have no problems. <laughs> but I think we pay a little too much attention to those Pew surveys. Pew survey does a, does a survey of how many Jews are in Jewish life and where they're connected. So it turns out who's the largest group in Jewish life, according to the last two Pew surveys. Take a wild guess. The Reform Movement. Not by a little bit, by a lot. In fact, the Reform Movement is larger than the conservative, the orthodox, the reconstructing Judaism movements all combined. They say there are two million people in North America who identify with the Judaism that we live. And yet there are probably only about a million Reformed Jews who are actually at this moment connected in an official way to some Reformed Jewish institution. So can we just account for the almost one million people who say they're with us, but they're not yet acting in a kind of very tangible way as a part of us? So what, what, what's, what's the, is the Pew survey wrong? Is it giving us bad information? What do you mean the two million identify with, but only a million actually show up. What, what, what can we learn from that? What's the, what's the takeaway that might be instructive to us? Any thoughts about that? Rabbi Larry Hoffman can answer all the questions, but we're going <laughs> well, to save the really hard ones for Larry, because it would just, it'd be a waste of his intellect to give him the easy ones. But, but I, a serious question. What, what would account for a, almost a million people who say they're with us, but they maybe haven't taking that step to really connect in a, in a real official way. What, what, what is that? What, what, what does that tell us? Yeah. Sorry? So I don't know if I, they don't want to belong, absolutely. And they don't like the institutions or they're not thinking the institutions are the way they want to show up in Jewish life. Excellent. What else? 
So there's a whole narrative about religion in this 21st century is kind of a thing about yesterday, right? This whole idea that people are finding their meaning in other places. So this is part of a larger trend. And those people are not one million about to come in the door, but one million that actually have camped out in a different place. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. So it could be something cyclical. So I, I just want to point out that this is one of our big, when I talk about growing reform community, there actually are people who identify the Judaism that they most respect and feel connected to is ours. So I think if you're just trying to build bridges, those are the people that not only we should think about, what we should find. So it turns out there are more Jews outside of all of our institutions than are inside. What are all those institutions? You name them. Synagogues, uh, day schools, JCCs, federations, every Jewish uh, alphabet soup organization. There are more Jews outside than inside. So I want to ask, not rhetorically again, my kids always say at the dinner table, is that a rhetorical rabbi question or are you actually asking us? <laughs> so here's, here's a real question. Why? don't more people join congregations? And I think many of our congregations have suppositions about why they don't join. And they are oftentimes very limiting assumptions. So here are things that I think I hear in boardrooms. Why don't people join? You know, the people who live across the street, but they're not members. A, they don't care. They're too busy. They're secular. Or the really harsh judgment is they're self-hating Jews. Ugh, ouch, ouch. But I wanted to say that I think a lot of those assumptions may turn out not to be true. So I think already how we think about those outside. I had a guy who was a member of Westchester Reformed Temple, lived literally like across the street from the synagogue, and he left the synagogue. And every time I'd drive in the synagogue, he'd be out there, you know, washing his car or something. He'd always like waving, hi, Rick, hi, Rick. I'm thinking, you just left the synagogue, you know, like maybe, yeah, I know, temper that a little bit. Yeah. So 10, 10 years after he left the synagogue, he calls me. He says, I need you. My dad just died. Well, I actually remember his dad from the B'nai Mitzvah, from the baby namings. And, you know, it's that, it's that dilemma. Rabbis, canners, we get that call, right? He's not a member. So, um, so I'm thinking, like, what, what do I do here, right? Ten years across, he didn't move to Chicago. He moved to Chicago. Moved to Chicago. You gotta leave the temple. Moved across and felt okay. He was like waving to me. So, um, so I, I could, of course, give him a, a, like a rabbi lecture. You know, like what do you think? <laughs> you know, now you call me. What about? But his father died, so that's not what we do. So we we found we we, we took care of him because we love him. But I have to also say there are people who cycle through, right? I was connected, now I'm not. So the question is, what is this thing? What does it mean to be connected? And of course, you're at Larchmont Temple, so you actually live a pretty um, unique congregational life here. But I want to just remind you about some of the shifts that were uh, brought to the Reform Movement and now are part of Jewish life. And you'll maybe remember Rabbi Alexander Schindler, of blessed memory, who in 1974 said to the UHC board, We've got an application from a congregation in Los Angeles called Beit Chaim Chadashim. It's the first openly LGBTQ congregation, and they want to join the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. So Rabbi, Rabbi Schindler, who's a pretty uh, inspiring guy, he had them discuss it. And he was pretty sure he didn't necessarily have all the votes. But he said, we've got to do this because it's the right thing. And that was the first LGBTQ congregation to be welcomed into UHC in 1974. They just celebrated a big anniversary. This Rabbi Schindler had a view of Jewish life that was quite expansive and inclusive. He's also the one, remember, in the late 70s, about interfaith families. The whole Jewish world was going, you know, stay away, stay away. You're doing something wrong. Rabbi Schindler said, why, why are we doing that? Let's bring interfaith families in. So he already reconceived of what it meant to be part of our community. How do we expand the we? Part of why we grew 
And we grew dramatically after World War II, right? We were not the largest movement in Jewish life before the war. We were certainly not the largest movement in the late 19th century. But now we are. And you could argue that one of the reasons we grew is because we had a more inclusive view of Jewish life. We valued the idea that people should come and be part of this with us. And that is something that we still need to do. And people say, oh, be inclusive, check, we did that. What else you got? But let's actually think about some of the people who are not yet part of the we. Who are some of the people who don't feel part of this thing that we call our Jewish community? They could still feel a little bit disaffected or not quite welcome. Who are some of the categories of people who have not yet found that loving embrace? Jews or people of color. Very, very growing category. Turns out that the next generation is almost a quarter. Almost a quarter when you include Mizrahi, Jews from the Middle East, and you have Jews of color. It is a growing segment of our community. Who else? Anybody else left out of Jewish life that we could be? Yeah. Sure, Jews who have questions about what's, the, what's the, the thing that holds us together, what are the beliefs. So definitely that's a whole category. What about in some communities it's about, you know, are only liberal Jews welcome? What about conservative Jews, right? That might sound like a different category. But again, what's the, what's the embrace of the diversity? What about, you know, wealthy and low wealth? What about uh, some of the, you know, lifetime reformed Jews and the brand new? All those our categories. So I was, I was visiting one of our almost 850 congregations. I've not yet been to every one, but I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. And I walk in with a colleague from the URJ who is a black Jewish uh, woman who went to the same summer camp I went to. Uh, we have a lot of the same biography. We walked in. And by the way, it also described, this congregation described itself as warm and welcoming. I haven't met one that doesn't describe themselves. Yeah. And this congregation was also. So we walked in, and we were very warmly welcomed. And I was given a mishkan tefillah, and she was given a brochure. Okay, The brochure that she was given is the brochure that you give to people who are not Jewish, so they can know what we do here. It tells you, that's the Ner Tamid. That's the, that's the Bima. There's a Torah scroll. It tells you all the things that you might not know. It's very helpful. And it was done lovingly. There was nothing harsh about it. And she looked at me. She said, you know, this guy looks like he belongs, you know. But, but, but she happened to not be put off. But I can tell you, if you walk in and you're not in some very, very real way made to feel like you already belong, it doesn't, it doesn't, feel, it doesn't feel good. So we've got some work to do. So, of course, there's that uh, amazing Torah portion that we have this week. Um, Eve, which one is this again? This is a good one, I think. Which is the one you're teaching in the religious school? Which is the Torah portion we got? Vayera, thank you. Even, Elliot, you knew that too. Yeah, of course you knew that. So, it turns out Vayera has this amazing opening scene. It's uh, Abraham, and he's, uh, he's convalescing. He's just been through a Brit Milah uh, in his senior age, so he's not feeling perfect. It's a hot day, and he looks out of his tent, and there are three desert wanderers. They look like nobodies, um, but our Abraham doesn't care if they look like nobodies. And he runs out, and he brings them in, and they welcome them and feed them and all that. And it turns out these three desert wanderers, maybe they look like homeless people, turn out to be three angels. And Abraham doesn't know that but they turn out to change his life, right? One of them brings news that Sarah's going to have a child. One of them comes to do Bikor Cholim to, to make him feel better because he's not feeling his, his best self. And, um, and the, the third one comes because there's an urgent matter of justice in Sodom and Gomorrah. So these three nobodies change his life. Now, I don't know who's coming to temple tomorrow night, but I bet you there's some people who you're not expecting because we don't know them. Are they bringing something profound? They very well might bring the, the angel's message. 
And again, what is that the teaching of? The teaching is that the people we bring in, it's not just an act of Rahmanas. They should come in, they should find a, a place here, but that we grow by what they bring into our community. They make us more whole. And that, of course, is something that is profound. So what are some of the strategies that actually help us to grow the Jewish community? Who here has been yourself or a child or grandchild to Jewish summer camp? Okay. So Jewish summer camp is one of these big opportunities to bring people not just in, but really have an experience that could be shaping. Are there any past directors of camps in the URJ? <laughs> Rabbi Ivrun, of course, uh, the amazing um, director of Kutz Camp. Uh, I also know that this rabbi was uh, the dean of faculty when my kids were going to Eisner Camp in Great Barrington. And it turns out that when the first camp was about to be purchased, one of my predecessors, Rabbi Maurice Eisendrath, met with a group of Jews from Chicago who said, we've got a proposition. We, can we want to buy a summer camp in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. And Maurice Eisendrath, who knew everything, was right about pretty much everything, was really lukewarm about this. He kind of said, why, are we, why would we want to camp? We do, we do religious stuff. We do prayer books and curricular materials and congregations. Why would we do this? And then they said, well, we raised all the money. He said, OK, let's, let's try it. <laughs> Turns out to be rather transformational. That was the first camp. And there are now 14 overnight camps, including our six point side tech camp, and we even have the chair of our board in, in, in the house tonight. So these experiences, I know for me, I went to summer camp, one of our URJ camps in Northern California. My mom signed me up, didn't tell me. So I was talking about what we're we gonna do this summer, and my mom said, I signed you up for camp. I said, you did what? I, I thought I was gonna go like to Hebrew school in the summer. I thought it was like with chalkboards and uh, discipline and desks in rows. Turned out my mom did one of the most amazing things, and it changed my life. We also founded something called NIFTY, uh, low those few years ago in 1939. Can you imagine NIFTY, the youth movement, youth teen movement of the reform movement, founded in 1939, right on the eve of World War II. Such an amazing time. And many of us found our immersion into Jewish life through Nifty, and some of those are the same people who had camp and Nifty, right? So we know all those amazing, amazing things. So we did a survey a couple of years back of the alumni from camp and Nifty. You know what we found? We found that the impact of those experiences were more powerful than just about anything else in Jewish life, even more powerful than day schools. And if you're sending a child or grandchild to day school, I'm not trying to talk you out of it just telling you that we found that four out of five of the alumni of Nifty and our summer camps are currently engaged in Jewish life. Almost all of them are members of congregations or chavarot. Four out of five. There's literally nothing else in Jewish life that has that kind of impact. So again, that's a wonderful thing, but we don't yet have the entire movement sending our kids to any of our Jewish camps, and it turns out that there are other ways to bring more in. So what are some of the strategies? We just began this year, this fall, a project for early childhood, which may turn out to be even more powerful than our summer camps because it starts earlier. And it turns out that early childhood nursery school isn't just for the kids, it's also for the parents and the grandparents. We also see all the different ways that we can bring people to Jewish life, we have more people studying online intro to Judaism than ever before. And they're in places where there aren't large Mont temples. There aren't the other opportunities. So we bring whatever we can to get them to feel connected, to learn, to grow, to experience, and to carry the commitment forward. Can we talk about synagogues are the most adaptive institution in Jewish life? You got synagogues going back 2,000 years. You can go on a trip to Israel. You can visit synagogues. We have them you know, in areas around, particularly in the, in the north. And you can see the remnants of a 2,000-year-old synagogue. What's similar to a 2,000-year-old synagogue to what we have today? Uh, a few things, but not, not all the things. 
did they have membership dues to join? <laughs> did they have a brotherhood? Did they have a sisterhood? Did they do those things? The answer is they did not. Um, did they have um, religious school as a formal part? They did not. So I'm just giving you the flavor of how this changed. Did you know this is a different pew survey? There are, you don't have pews, you have chairs. I like that. But Temple Emmanuel on Fifth Avenue paid for all of their expenses by renting pews in the 19th century. It paid for everything. They didn't need to charge membership dues. They didn't need to charge a tuition for school. That's how they funded the synagogue. So could a synagogue have a different model for funding? How about a different model for religious education? Anybody here also um, go to Hebrew school when you were young? Put your hand up. Keep your hand up if you loved it. I rest my case. <laughs> rabbi, Rabbi Cantor. <laughs> rabbi. So I, I thought this was typical. My mom would drop me and my sister off at Hebrew school, um, and she didn't even stop the car. <laughs> she just slowed down, and she would just sort of like push us out and say, I'll be back in an hour and a half. Get Jewish. Well, that wasn't, you know, the only way that you could get Jewish learning. There were other modalities. And today, and, and, and by the way, to tell that story today, if your kids and you are reflecting on what happens here, it has nothing to do with that. The way in which Jewish education is alive at Larchmont Temple and in our best congregations is phenomenal. And it's taking what didn't work so well and making it better. So the, the models of how we learn, how do we pray? Does anybody remember a prayer book called the Union Prayer Book? You remember, I, I, I was this kid in reform school in uh, Orange County. We had to, we, we basically memorized the book, you know. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. Like, who talks that way? <laughs> I remember it. I remember it, and some of you do as well. But that, again, we, we've transformed the way we fund our institutions. We've transformed the way we learn. And yes, we have transformed the way we pray. The most, the most impactful person to change the way we pray is, of course, Rabbi Larry Hoffman, who's helped to not just raise up a whole generation, but led Synagogue 2000 and Synagogue 3000 to reimagine the sacred core of synagogue life, a transformation, uh, uh, not a technical, but a adaptive. How do we rethink and re-energize and reboot Jewish life in the most profound ways? Synagogues have changed dramatically in our lifetimes, and guess what? They need to change even more. What about some of the changes and transformations? What about the role of women in Jewish life? Uh, is, is that something that's been transformational, not just for our movement, but for Jewish life in general? Has the stained glass ceiling been shattered here at Larchmont Temple? Big time, right? We have current amazing clergy. We have, I'm, I'm thinking of Rabbi Mara Nathan also, breaking through. It turns out that we didn't just affect the way we think about sacred roles in our synagogues. The graduation at HUC this past year, the speaker at graduation was Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz, uh, the first Orthodox woman rabbi. And when she was giving her talk, she said, you know why I'm here? And Sally Prezan was sitting in the back row. She, she actually didn't know Sally Prezan, the first woman ordained in North America by the Reform Movement in 1972. And she said, I wouldn't be a rabbi in the Orthodox community if it were not for Sally Prezan's example. And if it were not for the reform movement's courage to change. Okay? And that change is still, uh, I think, is still taking place. We still have, unfortunately, still some things that don't quite uh, meet best practice. But again, we have not just changed and transformed ourselves our impacts are felt throughout the Jewish world in really profound ways. So let's get to some of the harder subjects, and I think this is where we'll dwell for the rest of the talk, and then we'll have a chance to do Q&A. What is it with the anti-Semitism of this moment? We met with uh, Homeland Secretary Mayorkas for the last three weeks, so he's in charge of keeping us safe and secure. And you know that before October 7th, the start of the war in Gaza, the, the massacre of our people in the south of Israel, the, the level of anti-Semitism was already very high. 
Since October 7th, it's gone up another 400%. Okay, it just, it's just no way to really get our heads wrapped around that. And in the last few weeks, you've all been paying attention. Any Cornellians here? Anybody went to Cornell? What, what, are we, what are we learning about Cornell? That they closed the kosher dining room. You can't have the students walk into the kosher dining room because that's going to be a risky experience just to walk in there. They, there's not a feeling of safety. What about Penn? What about Tulane? What, what about what's happening on the college campus? How are we going to do that? So this past Monday, there was a meeting with a group of us and um, Secretary Cardona from, from the uh, cabinet, who's the education secretary, Commitment is in two weeks to have a full plan to protect Jewish students, K to 12, and college. Who would imagine in this 21st century, this is what we would be actually not just thinking about, but focusing on? So this past summer, I was in Providence, Rhode Island, at a wonderful congregation, and my phone rang. I was meeting with the board. It was right before Friday night services. And uh, I, I, I looked at the phone. It's Rabbi Hara Person. The, the woman who leads the, uh, the rabbi leads the Central Conference of American Rabbis. So I take the call. I, I said to the, um, the board, this feel, just feels important. Turns out, uh, Hera had made, made aware that in Macon, Georgia, at uh, Temple Beth Israel, where they are celebrating their 150th, the rabbi looked out her window just before services, and there were neo-Nazis all out in front of the synagogue. And she did not know what to do and didn't feel like calling the local Macon, Georgia police department was going to be adequate. So she asked, did we have access to uh, the, the people who really are trained, the law enforcement like the, the FBI and the Secure Communities Network? So in literally a half an hour, law enforcement was there and they were protected. What happened the next day? The next day, this is the story of American Jewish life. The community, not the Jewish community, the interfaith community, the Christian community, the Buddhist community, the Sikh community, the Hindu community, they all showed up the next day to express the unity of the community. They were going to stand with the synagogue. Unbelievable. It wasn't organized by the synagogue. It was spontaneous. This is also part of what happened. Can I just ask what happened here in Westchester after the brutal massacre on October 7th? Did more people show up at vigils that we held? What happened when the Tree of Life uh, murders happened? Did people show up? Yes. Were they all Jewish? No. People showed up because we have built solidarity. We have built deep and profound connections. And that is something that we will not let go of. And it's not incidental. And the Jews in the 1930s in Germany did not have any of that. When Kristallnacht happened, there were no people who showed up the next day at the synagogues and said, we're standing with you. We stood alone. We were vulnerable. I'm not telling you that because we're not being smart and strategic and we're not afraid in some key ways. We are. But we have built uh, interconnectedness in the society that is truly remarkable and something that we will not walk away from and we will not in any way uh, mistake how profound it is. Let's talk about the war in Gaza. Here's the biggest takeaway about the war in Gaza. We are one global Jewish people. The day before October 7th, we were arguing about everything. And they were profound arguments about the nature of democracy, the nature of what it means to be part of the Jewish community, who's in, who's not. We were intensely in that. And then in one nanosecond, we were one global Jewish community. Quite extraordinary. It doesn't mean that we forgot the differences, is that we remembered what's the commonality. And that's been profound. Um, we're going to remember October 7th. I said to Larry, this is going to be one of those dates that when we have the prayer book on Yom Kippur afternoon, we talk about the telling of the Jewish story through history. And we tell the Ela Eskara, these remember, remember the ancient rabbis who were murdered. These are the stories that are going to be told for centuries to come. I was just in Israel. I came back uh, last Friday morning. I'm a rabbi. I've gone to a lot of houses of mourning. But I went into one particular house of mourning. My friend, uh, Ophir Lipstein, who was one of the most um, idealistic people I'd ever met, 
He was the mayor of the community right on the Gaza border. And he woke up on Saturday morning, October 7th, and something was amiss. And so he went and got um, a weapon to go out and see what needed to be done. And he went out, and there was a group of 20 Hamas uh, terrorists in a pickup truck. And in one moment, he was gone. They couldn't find Ofer's son, Nitzan, so they prayed that he was a hostage. Can you imagine praying that your son is a hostage? They prayed he was a hostage. But a week later, they found him, uh, and it was hard to identify him. But he was also killed on October 7th. Um, the widow and the mother of Nitzan, so Ofer and Nitzan, the widow, Vered, also lost her mother. So I walked into their house of mourning, and I felt like I sat down with Job. The pain was extraordinary. I don't tell you that it's one family, but this one family, symbolic of all the families, and the loss and the pain. And then I sat with families of the hostages, and one woman, Natalia ben Svi, she we were sitting in this room. She took my arm. She said, you've got to do something. You've got to tell President Biden he's got to do more to free the hostages. We've committed to do, and as a movement, I don't know if you've got this, do something even tomorrow night. Have a, have a chair with an Israeli flag. What do we got, Leora? So beautiful. So the promise to the families in that moment, they said, we heard about this idea of, of, of matching congregations to hostages. Do you think the reform movement would do that? So without asking all of you, I said, I said yes, of course we would. And of course you are doing that. So kind of remarkable when we think about that. The other person that I'll never forget, we sat in the north of Israel with the families that had been evacuated from Nachal Oz, which is right on the Gaza border. You could literally throw a baseball if you were a Red Sox, if you were, you know, I, I'm just trying to make him feel better. It didn't go so well this year, right? So they're so close, you could throw, you could throw over the fence and it could almost hit Gaza City. That's how close they are. And these families lived every day with mortars and danger. And Amir Tibon, who is uh, a, a journalist for Haaretz, he tells a story. If you watch, did you, who watched the story of Amir Tibon and his wife, Miri? It was on 60 Minutes. He literally, on that Saturday morning, knew he had to go into the safe room and close the door. He didn't have time to bring food or water. They just knew. They, they heard the sirens. They got right down there. They locked the safe room door. They were there for 10 hours with their 1-year-old and 3-year-old. And they told the 1-year-old and the 3-year-old, you can't make a sound. I must be a bad parent because my kids couldn't have gone five minutes without making a sound. These kids went 10 hours. And Amir, who's very connected, is calling all his friends, journalists at Haaretz, said, where is the IDF? Where is the army? Where are the people who are going to come save us? So finally, he says it to his father, who's a retired general, Noam Tibon. Noam says to his wife, um, we're going. And they leave Tel Aviv, and they go down south. And it's a whole military. And he says, I don't care. And he commandeers a group of Israeli soldiers, said, come with me. And they're going further, and they meet the terrorists, and they were able to, uh, to prevail, but a few of them were wounded. So Noam said to his wife, you take them now with the car, take them to the hospital, and I'll go down, and we're going we're gonna to get, we're gonna get uh, our kids and grandkids. Can you imagine? This is a 60-year-old retired general who is the only guy who's showing up in this moment. And so he gets in, they get into um, Nachal Oz, and they know, of course, they, they're there all the time. And they find the house. But before they can go to the house where their kids and grandkids are, they have to actually help someone else seems to need them more. They finally get there. And uh, Noam starts talking. He knows exactly the window where you can talk and be heard. And um, the one-year-old cries out, Saba Higia, Grandpa's here. He, he literally saved his kids and grandkids. So he tells this story. So I'm sitting in the north with Amir and his wife, Miri, 
and a whole group of the Nachal Oz people. These are the people who are so committed to building a shared society with Palestinians. These are not, these are not the harsh people. These are the most committed to peace. And they're saying, we don't know if we're going to be able to go back. Because we are not going to go back unless we can take our kids to Ghan and go to work without worrying. So what, what, what is the moment we're in? The thing that I was asked by President Herzog, who has been a longtime friend of the reform movement, spoke at our biennial in Chicago. He said, Rick, we need the reform movement. You're going to be the ones, when this war goes really in the hard way it's going to go, and people are going to lose support for the war against Hamas, you've got to make sure the reform movement is going to stand strong for the people of Israel, because the people of Israel know that Hamas can't just be um, hurt. Has to, they have to be uh, kept from ever having the military capacity to do what they're doing. The tunnels look more like the New York City subway system than it looks like something else. He says, Rick, when the casualties are going to be so high on the Palestinian side, and they're going to forget what happened on October 7th, is the reform movement be able to stand publicly? Are you going to be able to get the other faith leaders to stand with us? To be honest, I, I didn't know what to say. I, I said, we're going to do our best. But it's already getting pretty difficult. You just put on CNN. You just, for one minute, go on social media. Talk to young people. Talk to anybody. This is, this is the promise. It wasn't just to Buzi Herzog. It was to all those people, the, the people in Nachal Oz, all these amazing idealistic people said, Hamas is not the Palestinian people. It's a terror organization that wants to wipe out the people of Israel. And by the way, they have it out for all of us because they had the day of rage. So we got some hard things to do. Um, we're not out of the woods. We may just be getting into the hardest parts of the work ahead. But I, I think that's actually what I want to leave you with for the war, is that our work is maybe, it's not the same as putting on an IDF uniform. It's not the same as going into a tank into Gaza City. But if, if the United States and the people of the United States don't continue to support this war, the people in Israel believe they will never, ever be safe. That's as simply as I can say it. And, um, and it's not on the rabbis and the cantors and the officers. It's on all of us. So I just put that out there as something we're all going to um, we're all gonna have to fight. I want to end with a part of this Torah portion that I didn't focus on. But when the, pro the, the angel Gavriel brings the message to Abraham about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, he basically um, says God's going to destroy the people. And what does our Abraham do? Does he just say, oh, too bad? Our Abraham takes issue with God. He says, Is God, who's just and right, going to oversee the destruction of innocent people? So already, innocent people should not suffer destruction, right? So we can actually feel sympathy for the, the innocent Gazans, who are also, in some very real way, hostages of Hamas. But we are people of a faith that is very demanding, and we can hold our love and support and uh, loyalty to the people of Israel, to the safety of Israel, but we cannot lose our ability to feel the pain of those innocent uh, Palestinians, not just in Gaza, but also in other parts, including in, um, in the West Bank. So I'll just conclude with this, uh, this notion that's in the Torah portion, and it's in the Psalms, which is um, um, Esa Enai, lift up our eyes. What's the world that we not just see, but the world we could see? What's the world that we could build? What's the movement that we could build? What's the larger arc of what we are trying to shape? And I think this is a moment where we feel a lot of uh, we feel a lot of anxiety. We feel a lot of fear. But I also hope that we feel a lot of strength, our ability to stand our ground for the things that matter, 
be able to build a real community, not just in this amazing synagogue, but in this community, that we can actually, through the transformation of this moment, see our movement grow and deepen and be a force for good in the world. Uh, I await your really profound and difficult questions, uh, but I am grateful for this moment to have a chance to talk with you, to learn from you, and to together set our eyes on the future that we must build, and I know we will build. Thank you. That's, that's our job. We do that. You, know, you don't do that. I can give you, anybody who wants to ask a question, you can do it within 25 to 30 seconds of the start. Right? Once you get 30 seconds, the whole congregation is going to go, ah. <laughs> so, hey, please. Very much inspired by your work on Charlie and Jeff Sobel. How do we do what President Bush held out? When words have been weaponized, when by standing up for And maybe even our own families. Yes. Okay, that, that I've heard very intensely, particularly if you have you know, young adults in your family. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, I think when people say, we, we actually put out a statement. Um, it's still getting some pushback. We as a movement do not believe a ceasefire is morally justified. In fact, it would be horrific. Because a ceasefire would simply allow Hamas to restock, reload, and resume. But we did call because President Biden, by the way, the, the politician in Israel who has the highest um, approval rate is not Bibi Netanyahu. <laughs> it's not Isaac Herzog. It's Joe Biden. And Joe Biden, when he went there, gave the Israelis a huge hug. And then he closed the door with the war cabinet and said, listen to this. This can't go any which way you want. This has got to go according to international law, the ethics of your tradition. And in that moment, he also was saying that you've got to get humanitarian aid. You cannot do a siege and cut off water and cut off food and cut off fuel. Well, honestly, who gave me the, the most uh, compelling argument to cut off all of those? The families of the hostages. They said, this is our only leverage. If you, if you um, relent on that, there's no way we're getting our family members back. So what I want to suggest is if we're going to make an effective case, and I, I said this to the people in the cabinet, if we're going to make an effective case to our community that Israel has to go all the way and defeat Hamas, we cannot do it by ignoring and being callous to the the death of the innocent in Gaza. It, you know, first of all, we can't do it because we're people of faith. But if we're trying to actually win an argument, we'll not go even this far. So when I was on MSNBC, you know, and it was a, it was a little bit uh, kind of like you, you, you wouldn't you know, uh, try to argue against you know, uh, humanitarian aid, and I, of course not. And even mourning the loss. Can you mourn the loss and, and, and still be loyal to the state of Israel? You can. So I think the way we do this is to be really, um, it's not a both and, it's not moral equivalence. Because you know, Hamas is still the ultimate reason why there's a siege, right? And there's still the reason with their human shields. But we're also a people of, um, of, of, of goodness and ethics. So if we're going to make a case, it's got to be a case that has our hearts open, but also a loyalty to, we can't have what happened on October 7th. It can't happen again. 
Easy questions, yeah. So the question is, have you met with Jamal Bowman? He's our congressperson. He's not supportive of Israel. We have to get him out. Is that a fair summation? Okay. The, the answer is yes, because we've, we've not, you know, we haven't met a lot with one-on-one, -on -one, but we have met with the progressives. Um, this is all also a moment to thank the leaders in local positions, in state and federal, who have been there for us. Make sure we thank them. And those that haven't been, we hold them accountable. That's part of what we do, and we show up and impress that. Uh, I would just say also, uh, there are people who say the progressive uh, allies, particularly the black civil rights leaders, have not shown up for us. That's not been my experience. Reverend William Barber is arguably the most prominent black leader in the United States at this moment. If there's a Martin Luther King of today, it's Reverend William Barber. He, he texted uh, Jonah Pesner and me. He wrote an article in The Guardian, and in a full-throated way, he expressed deep mourning for the loss of our people on October 7th. He didn't just mush it together. He said it. And he called me, he called me on Tuesday, and I was afraid he's going to call and say, you know, i got to retract that because I'm getting a lot of flack. He has not retracted. He has stood his ground. So when people tell you, that particularly the black civil rights leaders have abandoned us is just not true. The NAACP, local chapters and national, have stood there. So who are the people who are standing with us? Let's note them. Let's actually thank them. Let's work closely with them. But there's some that have not been there for us, and some who can't even find a way to condemn what happened on October 7th to our people. If you can't find words to condemn that, said, said Reverend Barber, then you've lost your faith. But at the same time, if we can't find words to talk about the suffering, even of our enemies, and I don't think the Palestinian people are our enemies, Hamas is our enemy, we're also not going to win that. So uh, you do what you need to do with Jamal Bowman. I don't think, we're gonna, I don't think AOC is going to come over and uh, become the leader of the Zionist uh, enterprise. <laughs> but I also think that's our job. Our job is to hold them accountable. Another easy question over here. The solution, there are many solutions. First of all, uh, anybody here, don't raise your hand, but anybody here donate to their, their alma mater? Uh, you have a voice and you have a vote. And, and we're seeing actually a lot of people speaking up. What happened at Harvard, Wexner Foundation, they've been for 30 years partners with Harvard. I mean, tens and tens of millions of dollars. In one day, Les Wexner said, no more, that's it, we're out. Uh, and we're also seeing that happen in university settings where they're a little surprised. Uh, some of the administrators, some of the presidents seem to have a pretty weak uh, response, couldn't in some very simple way condemn what Hamas did to our people. So I think there's, there's a kind of structural, but the first thing I would say is we gotta get our people safe. We actually know how to do that. I felt safe, I came in, did anybody notice the Larchmont Police Department here? I felt great, pulled up, parked, saw the police there, said, this is good. We can do that on a college campus. Why are we not doing that? First Amendment, we gotta like, everybody's, got, yeah, but we also keep people safe. So that's the first thing that we're pressing for. And then we have to create environments where, frankly, students don't just feel, they have to feel physically safe, but they also have to feel safe in classes, express their opinion, be Jewish, wear a kippah, right? All those things should not be risky behaviors. So it's a whole host of things. And the federal government, this cannot be on uh, the Jewish community to protect our students and universities. That's the job of, uh, of government. That's the job of law enforcement. We're going to help. We're going to do our part. So pressing the government to actually take that responsibility and not give us this wishy-washy, you know, well, it's the academy. They have to have all kinds of ideas. I'm sorry. All kinds of ideas, yes. But... Um, uh, incitement to violence to other students? No, can't have that. Yeah.
Right, so he, here's this thing, we've been hearing this now for years, which is what's the relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, right? Uh, are those two separate things? Um, and I think there's been a lot of concern of conflating them always, because one of the fears was that if you're critical of the Israeli government, uh, that would be me, <laughs> that would be me all the time, uh, that that criticism is anti, uh, anti-Israel or anti-Zionist. We met with Prime Minister Netanyahu in New York a couple of weeks ago. He was here to give a talk at the UN, and um, he didn't want to take questions. There was just a small group of us in the room. Didn't want to take questions, but we just sort of pushed our way in. And um, so I, the, the lighter thing that I said, I pressed him on the judiciary reform, and I said, it's two days before Yom Kippur. You and members of your government have been demonizing those of us in the protest movement. I spoke at the protest opposite his hotel the night before. I figured I was going to get disinvited to the meeting, but I, they weren't paying attention, and I got, I got included. <laughs> I said, demonizing people leads to harming people. So on the eve of Yom Kippur, anything you want to share. Um, he's still thinking about it. But I was sitting with the head of the OU, the Orthodox Union. I was sitting with the head of the conservative movement, who is the head of the Rabbinic Association and the United Synagogue. And I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu, I said, just before I even tell you my question, just look at us. We're not just randomly sitting here. We actually are friends. We work together. One of my dreams for the state of Israel is that this could happen once or twice in the state of Israel, because it doesn't happen at all. So I just throw that out because criticism is healthy. It is good. Criticism of Jamal Bowman. Criticism is not anti. It's actually sometimes very healthy. So we've been really militant about keeping those separate. But in this moment, we're seeing the blending of anti-Semitism that is at the same time anti-Israel, anti-Zionist. And I don't think it always is. I think you can still be critical, very critical, and not be anti-Semitic. But the truth is, it's a, it's, a, it's a distinction today that we are very, very um, different in our view than we were a month ago. And that's also one of the changes. Can we, t can we take a couple more, Rabbi? If you've got homework and you have to go or do your, <laughs> thank you for coming all together. I'm sorry, th th this is an amazing couple. I did their wedding. Um, we, we, we dreamt of maybe you'll have a couple of kids, four, and Michael grew up at Westchester Reform Temple. I'm not going to announce this tomorrow night at WRT, but there's a whole group of WRT that's now moved over here. So, <laughs> so let's, let's give them a chance to ask a question or maybe have an answer. So the question is, what do you do about not just keeping our kids safe, but how do they, they're going to be powerful leaders, how do they help to kind of like reclaim the academy, right? To make it a place not only of ideas, but of moral commitment. And that, of course, is what we try to do when we raise our kids in synagogue in a tradition that holds Torah and Torah values as primary. I hope that we send, that we, we say like, one of, one of my uh, Leaders from NIFTI asked me on Monday to write a letter of recommendation for Penn. <laughs> you, you can't make this up. So I, my answer, I love this kid. He's like one of our best leaders. I did have to say, you sure? You sure? So I, I think we want, I don't know that we want to say, don't go to these institutions, but show up as yourself. Show up as a person of character, a person of conviction, and take on. The, um, there was an uh, independent school, it was a wonderful small college uh, near the Hudson River. I can't tell you which one because the story is a little bit uh, edgy. But one of our reform Jewish leaders, as a sophomore at that university, took on the president. This kid said the president is, 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 uh, is doing things that are so hostile to Israel that it's, it's just wrong. This kid pressed so hard that the president actually was replaced. 
Now, and didn't do it in an unethical way, just got everybody organized. So I actually think that one of the things that the tools that we give our young people is to show up. Show up in the places where maybe there aren't people standing up and you stand up. Don't do it in a cavalier way where it's not safe. But I think this is a moment. And it's not just the Jewish community that's going to be unsafe. We are the canary in the coal mine, right? Very often when the Jews are not safe, um, believe me, the White House is about to come out with a whole project on Islamophobia, right? And there are a lot of folks who are not safe. But right now, friends, we're not safe. And we're really adamant about what it means for American society if that's the case. So we're not going to just sort of like hope it gets better. We're going to be the active, demanding community that we are because everyone deserves to be safe. You know what it means when the rabbi stands up? Please. Well, I wouldn't say, of course, in many settings. Uh, I know here, yes. So I, I think the question is, how can I be, how can I be true to my ethical commitments to the suffering of Palestinians, the, the deep mourning? They're, they're, whether you believe, you know, the, uh, the Gaza Health Authority, right? Who's the Gaza Health Authority? I, like, I have this image of people walking around in white coats, you know, like, you know, can we help? It's, it's Hamas, right? So I don't, we don't know the numbers, but we can, we can be certain it's a significant number. And there are people who don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear a sentence. And some of those people are Israeli siblings who can't hear that right now because they're so afraid and they're so focused on their own pain, right? So at, let, let's be judicious about when we actually marshal those arguments. But I also find every day I'm having multiple conversations with non-Jewish leaders who don't seem to have that empathy for what's happened to our people and the vulnerability of even you know, the amazingly powerful Israel is very vulnerable. It's existentially at risk at this moment. So when, when people tell me you know, right away, what do you think what's happening to the Palestinians? And I say, breaks my heart. Can we talk more? What do you think about what's happening to the Israelis? What do you think Hamas has done to the whole future of the people of Gaza. So I think in those moments, if we can try to move someone who's only got the worry and the pain of the Palestinians, they have seen very little for what helped them out. And I think in the case where it's the Jewish feel out whether it's possible to kind of give a little bit of a sense, even if it's just the instrumental way, this will help us make the case for Israel. But this is really delicate stuff. And I have people screaming at me. You'll have people screaming at you. Nobody is in their best self at this moment. We're afraid. The pain is so enormous. We're traumatized. So in a moment like this, let's also take lots of breaths. And it may not be the time to have the full argument or the full discussion. So let's also make space. We heard a brilliant sermon today from a rabbinic student who is a former president of Nifty. And one of the things he taught us, he said he was giving a really strong sermon but he made space in the sermon for people who might disagree. It's something that usually you have to be out and have gray hair to think that way. He already had it as a, uh, a fourth year student. So let's, let's make the case. Let's do it from our hearts, but use you know, our seichel too. But there are times where you know, less is going to be more, and there are times where more is what we need, and just figure out which one's which. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>